So there's a question here from Irene Mann. Um, no, I think this is actually for, oh, okay, in the US. So I think this is for Noel. Um, why do you think the coverage of HPV vaccination is more hampered by the COVID pandemic than other vaccine programs in the US? So some of it's by design. The US specifically prioritized ages zero to two for vaccination. That allowed us to ensure that these children had protection against uh, several childhood diseases, including measles. And given the problems with uh, almost losing our measles elimination status a couple of years prior, this was a big priority for the United States. Uh, there's another issue, which is that schools are, were largely closed. And so the closure of schools meant that children were not, uh, that uh, adolescent children uh, did not have to abide by the school entry requirements for other adolescent vaccines. And that caused a drop in all adolescent vaccines, including HPV vaccination. So the combination of the prioritization of younger ages, the closing of clinics, and then, or not the closing, well, partial closing, and then complex accessibility of clinics, and then the closing of schools, all those things together created the problem that we have. And there's a question here from uh, Mauricio uh, Matza uh, to Carlos. Uh, is there a reason for a drop in the second dose in 2019? Uh, not that I'm aware of the explanation. If you see the second doses in Colombia, they are very, very low. And uh, we have been asking the question to the Ministry of Health, of why is it that uh, on the first doses we have been able to achieve better result, but on the second doses, it's really very disappointing. And nobody has a, quite, a good explanation for that. Uh, we know that there's a couple of studies saying that one dose is enough, but that, that, that is not the reason because in Colombia, we are not talking about the possibility that one dose is, is good enough. So uh, that's uh, one of the mystery, mystery questions. I don't know why the second dose in Colombia is so low uh, compared to the, the other countries. Well, um, I think that one of the reasons is that in the uh, immunization protocol, they had trying to keep the second dose at six months interval. Uh, so we had discussed this that in, in based in the recent data, perhaps this interval should be extended to one year or even more. Uh, and this is, is being discussed at the Minister of Health now. Suzanne, can I make a comment? It's Margaret it's Stanley. It's Margaret. Yes. I think um, the, the two presentations show some really important um, basic points. Certainly from Joanne, I think it shows the value of the organization that we have with immunization services in the UK and the fact that they're locally based and that they communicate with each other so that you could, they reacted quickly to what was clearly going to be a problem with the closure of schools and the JCVI gave very clear recommendations. So there, because the infrastructures there and the organizations there, the program has suffered very little. And similarly from Colombia, it shows the value of having a champion and the vaccine program has been championed by prominent citizens in Colombia by the government and by people like Nubia and Javier who have an international reputation. But I think it, in both instances, it's about having a strong infrastructure and a strong um, organization and good local interaction. I think that's the message for um, uh, pretty well everywhere where the vaccination programs are suffering. Thank you, Margaret. I couldn't uh, agree more. I, I do have a, a question or a, maybe a topic that we might discuss a little bit further. Uh, Noel addressed the issue that there currently is no possibility to co-administrate the COVID vaccine <clears throat> with the adolescent 
although it's a big opportunity, of course, to invite all the adolescents for vaccination. So I don't know if somebody wants to further elaborate on that. Is there something foreseen to tackle that? Is, should we put more pressure to make sure that this happens? So I don't know if anybody from the audience would like to respond to that. I mean, to some extent, we need data. And so the data are being collected right now. So Pfizer has the trial that they have the data from. And then other, at least one other company has a trial that's ongoing. So we can only license vaccines when, they're, um, when, when there's data to support it. Um, that will be uh, an important change for the US, but also for other countries. I saw Margaret raising her hand. Or was it? Still from the previous. No, I've 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 lowered it, but I was just going to support what Noel Brewer's just said. If you don't have if you don't have data from trials showing that co-administration is safe and you generate the same immune response, then there's no way any uh, recommendation can be made. And with the current concerns about COVID vaccine safety, I think getting those trials ongoing is quite tricky. If I, if I can say something, uh, Alex. Yes, please. Just to invite the board to take a look at the website and at the publications that we have included in, the, in both the HPV World newsletter and the e-learning courses, because the e-learning courses are available in seven languages and the use of the newsletter can be easily calibrated and adapted to address any specific issue that is of interest to any of the corners of the world. So this is an ongoing project that is might be useful to many other of the participants in this board. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then I, I also have a question to the, let's say the Colombian team, because Carlos showed a slide where he pictured Nubia and Xavier as Don Quixotes, but maybe he should put himself together with them and call it the Three Musketeers, because it was not just fighting the windmills, it's really making having impact uh, in Colombia. But, but my question is, because I, I think it's amazing what has been done, but, but is there any advice on how this could be implemented in other countries, other situations? Uh, because I have the feeling there's, there's so much personal input and um, effort in it. Is, is this something that, that we could take as a lesson learned and, and see that this is happening in other regions or countries? I think that what was just said that you need local champions to canalize and to channel the outside information that can be of use and then the, the educational resources that are available are immense. You just need to find them and channel them. So any other country suffering from a similar situation can can benefit not only from the Colombian experience, but also from the one in Denmark and the one in Ireland that we've been experiencing. And perhaps one of the conclusions for the board is that uh, uh, after we go to a specific country meeting addressing issues that are of relevance to that country, do not leave that collaboration any longer. And specifically identify members of the, of the board that are uh, interested in collaborating with the local champions and, and be persistent. That's the name of the game in HPV, be persistent, continuously improve your educational materials. We all know that the, the role of the healthcare providers as the, the stronger link between science and population, that should be reinforced. And, and, then, and then use use the wealth of information that is available already to support the local champions. If you don't mind, I'd like to share some data from Denmark real quick, just to, to underline the point that Xavier made about some of these efforts in Denmark. Would that be possible? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So 
Um, this slide, it's uh, just the PDF of an article that uh, I did with, with Peter Hansen. So we all, many of us know the story about Denmark. What happened is that there was uh, an un, unsubstantiated safety scare. And so you have this baseline period that went from roughly 2009 to 2013. And so that's this period right here. And then there was a, um, uh, this unsubstantiated safety scare that got picked up in some newspapers. These are the sort of things you pick up by the side of the road. Uh, you know, or you know, at a bus stop and so on. And that caused a, caused a bit of a drop in HPV vaccination uptake. And that's the second period right here. And that was mostly driven by media, uh, print media. However, then there was, uh, you know, some period of time later, about a year and a half later, the this, this safety issue got picked up by the national, uh, one of the national television uh, stations, um, which ran um, a documentary. And that documentary had many problems with it actually, but also uh, was just somewhat sensational and, and just somewhat divorced from the, the reality of what we know in the science. So that caused uh, overall a drop in uh, HPV vaccination uptake by 50%. Then uh, the, the, the country finally got to work. They stood up for the vaccine. They, they put up a national campaign that involved uh, social media, print media, broadcast media, and so on. And very quickly in this final period uh, of this information campaign, they very quickly got back up to, uh, to the rates they were before and maybe even just uh, very slightly above. So the, one of the lessons here that I think is very important is that the people at the front of the room have to stand up for vaccination in order to ensure that uh, vaccine uptake remains high in order to, 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 to create and maintain resilience in a vaccination program. It is very important for the folks who run that program and who also run the country to stand up for it. In places where there, there have been elections during, uh, during uh, HPV vaccine rollout, that's been a problem. So in Romania, they've tried to introduce the vaccine a couple of times and failed because both times overlapped with uh, a national election. In Japan, there's also, whether or not polit politics played a part, um, the, 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 the key thing there is that the, the people at the front of the room did not stand up for, for HPV vaccination. And so we had rates drop from, you know, let's say 80% down to less than 1%. We'll hear about that. I think there's another personal talk about this in an, uh, at another period today. But the, um, uh, the key elements that I see here are that the po politicians and politics play a big role in this. And that if, if, uh, if the people running the immunization branch don't have support, vocal support from the very top, that that will create a problem. The public gets that and that causes an erosion of trust. However, when the folks at the front of the room stand up for the vaccine, then you end up, end up being able to create and maintain trust. So it's a local effort, which I completely agree. It's always about every last local organization and person and advocate. And we saw powerful exam examples of that. But we also need to have folks at the front of the room at the top of the, the top of the organizational chart, uh, endorsing and, and ensuring a strong vaccination program. Can I say something, uh, Suzanne? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, I, I I want to support. Of course, I'm I'm also I'm from Denmark, obviously. So uh, I can only say that uh, I I support fully what has just been said, but also I want to emphasize that. The, uh, the technical or the country specific meeting that we had in Copenhagen uh, back in that time was immensely useful because even though there are in some countries local champions, it is really a big help that the other uh, persons within the medical society or where, uh, where else uh, can see that there is a national international <coughs> backup of this uh, specific field. And we could feel in Denmark that there was two things that were really important. One was that the country specific meeting with all the, uh, the experts backing up what we have already said for a long time, but also that, um, that actually the society of the medical uh, organizations and different uh, other societies like the National Board of Health actually joined forces because before that time it was single persons and they were sort of hunted down by the journalists. So it was really, really a, a tough matter. So I can only support that a joint forces is really, really important. So thank you. And I think Margaret, you have your hand up. Yes, I was about, 
I was going to say there's another issue that we mustn't forget, and that is when you have a successful program running, do not become complacent um, and, and think that it's going to continue. Then, so this this point that Xavier makes about persistence and constantly monitoring um, anti-vaccine or concerns that are being raised so that you can immediately answer them because if you allow them to fester away they'll be taken up and widely publicized and there'll be an instant reaction but um I've, everything everyone else has said i totally agree with but complacency please don't be complacent because it'll turn around and bite you and i, and I think also uh, just to endorse the point made um whoever uh, is standing up for HPV, whether it be the Minister of Health, um, a president of a society or whatever, it needs to be done quickly. It, it can't lag for a, a long period of time. And I think where there have been adverse events uh, published uh, in different countries uh, relating to HPV vaccine, hitting, a, hitting the nail on the head quickly is uh, vital as well but it gets left as, for example, in Japan, where really the ministry would not get involved for um, a huge uh, space of time. <clears throat> Can I have a word, uh, Alex? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, at least in my country, we now have the media, the radio stations and the TV full of information on vaccines, vaccination, COVID vaccines, this and that. I think it would be wise to start thinking and preparing a rationale and a description on how we could use this wave of interest on vaccines to replace and reinforce the need for the HPV vaccine. And that should be should be conveyed to the media, to the speakers, to the many discussions and, and people uh, expressing opinions in the social media. So it, it, it penetrates that, that discussion and the population will benefit by upgrading their background information on vaccines. <clears throat> I wonder if the board can address that in a, in a specific declaration or a specific uh, guidance on how to take advantage of the tsunami that the COVID vaccines are creating in the public opinion and, and clearly position the HPV vaccine as part of this preventive effort. Okay, thank you, Xavier. We will definitely further look into that. Um, I just want to also refer regarding this discussion that, that being prepared is, is very important. And I think it's very interesting, the presentation from Alaya Bruni this, this afternoon or later in the day or evening um, is also something that we should take into account because apparently a lot of countries that start with uh, suboptimal coverage are having a hard time to improve that. So I think that would also be very interesting to take that into account that it's really being well prepared from the start and then uh, being sure that you are resilient if, if something happens. I don't know if there are other questions or remarks. Un unfortunately, yeah. Joe didn't join us yet. I see Pierre raising his hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Okay, now it can work. Now, just two points I, I want to make that are um, already uh, referring to what uh, I heard and to what Xavier said. I think we can also turn it the other way around. I think the way uh, a lot of us now have to communicate on COVID-19 uh, vaccine issues in the many countries is because we learned a lot from previous uh, crisis communication, whether it was with hepatitis, with measles, with uh, human papillomavirus. So 
all the arguments that I heard just uh, a few minutes ago uh, in terms of uh, rapid communication, uh, have it, having a very good uh, relation between the experts and the policymakers, using the same kind of figures, uh, having a very good and trustful contact with the public and with the media. All these elements, I think, we now use already in uh, trying to address the COVID-19 vaccine situation and also sometimes the crisis communication related to the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So luckily, I think that's uh, a positive lesson learned from the past. On the other hand, I think what Xavier says is important as well. Uh, COVID-19 is on the uh, agenda of many media and of course, many people. Uh, including the prevention uh, elements and uh, immunization. And this is a perfect opportunity to explain to people how important immunization in general is. Uh, we have the uh, uh, WHO immunization week coming up now in the last week of, um, of April. And I hope and I'm convinced that this is a, the, the ideal opportunity not only to focus on COVID-19 vaccines, but in particular on EPI programs, on HPV programs in schools, uh, and to clearly explain parents uh, that uh, this is the way to go to prevent cervical cancer, to prevent, um, I would say, all kind of uh, long-term and short-term consequences of infectious diseases in the population. So we should take that opportunity, absolutely. Thank you. I think this is a really important comment uh, by several people, which is that we have to take into account the changing landscape that we're in, that HPV vaccination used to be sort of its own thing, and it will continue to do so. But for the time being, the, the fate of vaccination more generally is going to rise and fall with whatever happens with safety issues around COVID-19 vaccination. Another thing that's happened is that the, the general uh, the general landscape of anti-vaccine vaccine activism has substantially changed, at least in the U.S., and so they have become more sophisticated, they've become fundamentally political, and they've become very skilled uh, at using various, way, uh, various resources to, uh, to generate attention and then to undermine vaccination. So they've sort of, they've, they seem to be morphing from uh, specific, having specific concerns about vaccination to sort of targeting vaccination as just being the, the, the cause of all sorts of uh, ills that we have. But also they've tried to move into a medical freedom frame. And that unfortunately aligns very closely with many conservative ideologies about freedom and freedom of choice. So in the US, we're having to, to rethink how we're, uh, how we're dealing with these anti-vaccine folks as a, as a more general problem and also one that is um, more potent than it used to be. So I see both uh, sunshine on the horizon and also rain. And I, I don't know how this is gonna shake out, but I think we have to be active. And I really like this uh, perspective of thinking proactively about how to, um, how to uh, address these, these twin issues. So, thank you very much. And I think we have one uh, more comment from Mel Clon. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Suzanne. Uh, great discussion. Just to, to build on what uh, Noel said, and I have to confess this is more an impression than I don't have hard data to back this up, but I, I think we need to be very thoughtful as we think about capitalizing on what's happening with the uh, COVID vaccine, because it, it's true, it has um, for many people emphasized how useful and wonderful vaccines can be, but it also has really kicked up a lot of anti-vaccine sentiment. So it almost seems like there's been movement in both directions of the distribution, if you will. So I, I just think we've gotta be very, very thoughtful about this. Uh, and, and one other comment I wanted to make, you know, um, Noel, thank you for raising the issue about the COVID vaccine rollout in adolescence and the collision that this will have with the back to school vaccination catch up in the US. Um, of course, the situation in every country is a little bit different in terms of patterns of vaccination and so forth. But I do think, uh, and, and I hope that ACIP, when they issue whatever recommendations they will issue about the adolescent uh, vaccination against COVID will make a clear mention of the importance of not falling behind on uh, the other vaccines that happen because that announcement, whatever they say, is gonna capture an enormous amount of media attention. And it's an opportunity to, to put forth this other message about the importance of more routine vaccination too. So uh, I just wanted to make that point as well. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think we've um, hit the time. Uh, so if I could thank everyone for the discussion, uh, for their uh, contributions. And um, I guess we've, we've heard very much the importance of good education, uh, rapid action by multidisciplinary groups, particularly at the level of min uh, ministries of health, as well as having champions within the um, medical profession to act quickly to deal with um, potential adverse outcomes. And I think um, Joanne made a very good point too, thinking around flexibility of programs so that we can fit in the catch up. And, and as Margaret raised the importance of having local rapid action in terms of uh, flexibility and of, of infrastructure and organisation. So if I can remind you that uh, you now have a break of um, 35, 55, yes, 45 minutes, whether it be lunch, breakfast or dinner. And we'll see you back for session 2A future approaches for HPV vaccination. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So see you all in 35 minutes. So it's 35 minutes past the hour, wherever you are.